there, and now you, you can stopped it. it on the clock. I guess we could say this is the this is the the non-meeting so far, but uh, a gathering uh, focused on updating those present on how it's going with the planning effort. And uh, we did plan on it being a short meeting. It may be an even shorter meeting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So Joel, do you want to go directly to privilege of the floor? Yeah, well, I mean, I suspect everybody here is interested in the main topic, but does anybody want to address the board about something else that we, that we haven't already spoken about? <laughs> There's no board to address anyway. <laughs> I could actually just uh, pass on a, a thank you, although he's not here. Uh, I started hearing some um, chainsaw noises yesterday maybe even Saturday, I thought it was an insect at first, but then I went outside. And today I began hearing heavy equipment noises as well. And I gave Steve Courtright a call and just to ask if he knew of any logging. In mm -hmm. the area. And I got to tell you, within an hour, he was on site. He had found out who was doing it. It was my neighbor. Distances <laughs> along here. I thought it was far away, but it was my neighbor. And he was basically just getting rid of ash trees. Um, and so it was perfectly innocent, um, but Steve was right on top of it instantly. Yeah, wow. Well, That's a good sign. We just got texted by Matt saying he, he forgot. He'll be here in about five minutes. So anybody else have anything, anything they'd like to say? Anybody else here? The, the plant sale or the plant exchange had a record number of people in attendance this year. So yeah, it was phenomenal. Was, yeah, there were like almost 100. There were like 90 people. Really? Came. Did you count? Well, Dan did. Yeah. You know, the parking lot of the fire hall was full. Yeah. The street was also parked and up and down the uh, uh, Gunderman as well. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the fire hall, I'm sure you'll all do your civic duty tomorrow. And vote What's in up? the school board elections, where they proposed a budget that's 6% over net last year. <laughs> Damn about school? School board and school yeah. district, yeah. Is the school, is the Ithaca City School District different than the other school districts or are they all tomorrow? Uh, they're all tomorrow. It's uh, by law. You haven't heard a word about Newfield. 1.1%. Mm. Did you get a mailing? Did you get a mailing, Bruce? Yeah. And well, that night I went and actually looked it up. Huh. How I was I looking for something it. else and I stumbled into it. That's how well, these things usually work. Yeah. It's the largest budget with the least amount of public comment. Wow. <laughs> least, and least amount of local actual uh, flexibility. It was that too. So you can argue over what's the point. You can argue over sports and, and art. Yeah. <laughs> The Ithaca Time, was it Ithaca Times article? Whatever, the, one of the weekly rags that did a, oh, Ithaca Voice, I think it was online. Uh, they they described the, um, they spent a whole article on the budget increase. And the last line they said, and oh yes, four people are running for three seats. That was it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good, that was a good, was it the Ithaca Times that had a pretty good spread on the, who, who the candidates yeah, the were? The Times is one that had this yellow school bus on the cover. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that was pretty, pretty reasonable. Well, welcome, Matt Ulinski, uh, Mr. Mr. Quorum. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I'm glad. Sorry about that. I um, was enjoying the good weather. And so was I. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm sure we would all rather be doing that. Anyway, apologies. Well, now that you've arrived, we actually have a meeting. And we have been 
talking about other things than the, the topic of the day. Um, but now that you're here, we can we can move on to that since I think we've pretty much exhausted other comments on other subjects. So take it away, David. All right. Um, I, I think we will try to keep it short. Um, I think most of the people here have been to all of the meetings, um, but I do want to make sure that we're kind of documenting uh, where we've been and where we're going. Um, as of today, we are uh, more than halfway through May, and the months of May and June are the months that we're working out the details of the various zones. Um, so in the most recent meetings, uh, what we've been working through with the Hamlet group um, is uh, reviewing kind of a full draft of zone parameters, um, and those were attached to the agenda um, and in the, in the folder on only office. Uh, and the, the goal there, uh, where we've started, and we really haven't um, done a lot of editing of it yet. I expect we'll do more in the next three meetings. Um, but where we started with there is making it as easy to build in the Hamlet as possible uh, while keeping some controls to make sure that um, development that happens is um, people-friendly, walkably, walkable-focused. Um, kind of some, some minimum standards, but generally um, keeping what's possible pretty wide open. Uh, we've also been tinkering with the actual uh, zoning map, um, which so far we've had uh, change, a change map coming out every week um, and that will continue changing. Um, and that map was, the last map was included in uh, the agenda as well. But I, I have it on my screen and can share if if we want to talk about it. Um, but it's it's basically already obsolete because each meeting we have, we review um, the map and um, come away with changes. So uh, I expect a new draft will be coming out by Wednesday in anticipation of our our next meeting with the conservation group. Um, but it it may be useful, particularly. Um, for Matt and for Bruce um, to review, this is a little slow, to review the zones that we have um, and uh, where we're at with those. So I'm going to try to readjust my screen here a little bit and we can look at the list of zones. Um, so I've got a, a list here from the least restrictive. Um, and highest density to the most restrictive and lowest density, um, starting with the Hamlet core, uh, where we've really delineated in uh, both of the Hamlets, uh, where the, the center of activity should be in the Hamlet core has the most allowed, including having some housing and a small amount of commercial development in very small buildings allowed um, by right without additional review. Um, in the Hamlet neighborhood, there's less commercial allowed. The commercial that is allowed is required to be smaller and has additional review. Um, then stepping out of the Hamlets, uh, we have a suburban character zone and neighborhood zone that is uh, areas that have been mostly built out under the current zoning. And I think in our discussions, um, there is some question of if we'll keep um, that zone or not, or if we'll have a zone that's um, slightly more restrictive than the current rules, um, rather than keeping something totally the same. Um, the next step up in um, restrictiveness is the rural character two. So this zone, we were talking about a 10 acre minimum lot size, um, enabling some more clustering than we currently have. Um, and then when you step up to the rural character one, the zone has more steep slopes, more uh, parcels that are in UNAs, other environmental features that are important to conserve. So in addition to a larger lot size, we're also talking about site plan review for most buildings um, and other controls on what's allowed there. So the, both of those zones, um, we're trying to keep the lots larger than they've been in the past. Uh, and then the difference there is how much- David, are, are, we really talking lot, are we really talking lot size or just average density? Average density. Um, 
which you know does have an effect on that the, the clustering that allows the lot sizes to be smaller if you cluster them. Um, and then in the high priority preservation zone, we were talking not just average density, but actually limiting um, a minimum lot size of 25 acres. And this can you, just, zone, can you explain the difference between average density and, and lot size? Yeah, so currently the way the zoning works for the low density residential is that there's a five acre average density minimum and a two acre minimum lot size. So if you had a lot that was 10 acres, you could subdivide it into a two acre and an eight acre, and then you would still have an average density of five acres per lot. Okay. Um, yep. So um, then that high priority preservation zone, the way we've designated that is it's the state owned parcels, it's the municipally owned parcels, it's the land trust owned parcels, and then other people who would like to have their lots added to that zone voluntarily can do so, um, but we won't be putting people's land in it um, without their permission. Um, that's kind of a compromise we've come to as the group. Uh, so you can kind of see how those um, lay out. The dark green is the most restrictive. The light green is the next most restrictive. The green hatching is the rural character one that's less restrictive than that. And then in our hamlets, we're working on having a, a small core and a larger neighborhood and really looking at a half mile radius. Um, and we've been adjusting, we're working on adjusting those boundaries. So one of the comments we got in the most recent set of meetings is that um, using the whole parcels, which is what I've done, I put whole parcels in each zone. Um, some of these really long parcels, the, the context changes enough that we need to split the parcel into multiple zones. Um, so that's a, a good look at where we're at with the hamlets. I think one of the, the more contentious questions is, um, do we keep a zone that keeps the rules basically the same? Are there areas where we're okay with um, kind of stasis in terms of zoning rules or do we want um, stronger controls that um, do more to protect rural character in all of the town that's outside of the hamlet? And that's, that's I think, one of the bigger ongoing questions. And then the, the other discussion item that's really, uh, I hope we'll get into more this Friday is um, how and where we can facilitate a transfer of development rights system. So this is something that um, Joel had proposed us looking more at ways that we can transfer development rights within um, different neighborhoods around the town. Um, and it, it, in a conversation I was having uh, today, actually, um, I was noting that with the way uh, I've developed the first proposal for the Hamlet zoning, where it's very unrestricted, there isn't much reason why somebody would need to transfer development rights into there because we've kind of said with the zoning, we really want it, development here. We really want it to be easy to develop there. Um, so it would be most likely that development rights would be transferring around from one part of what's currently the low density residential to another part, which um, it is good to concentrate that development to um, maximize the contiguous preserved spaces rather than kind of spreading it thinly um, elsewhere. But I think it, it's up for conversation if we want to um, maybe reduce what's allowed in the hamlet so that there's some incentive to pull in development rights for other parts of the town, or if we want to stay as straightforward as possible and just allow what we want to see. Um, and so for, for this Friday and then um, several weeks following, we'll be continuing um, working through modified versions of the zoning to bring a complete version to the town board in early July. Does anybody have questions about that broad overview? I do, but my dogs are howling, so you'll have to wait a oh. little. <laughs> you wanna put it in the chat, Matt?
stop the share for a second. Do have a question. As, Good. as an alternative, as an alternative to conservation easement, I mean, um, transfer of development rights is one alternative to conservation easements. They both extinguish development rights. Well, not really, because the the, um, the TDR isn't necessarily permanent, but the conservation easement is. Oh, you mean you could buy them back? Well, you know, the town could change the rules. Well, let's assume that the town is consistent, just for a moment. Yeah. Uh, and I realize that is an assumption. Um, wouldn't it kind of make sense to require to require the purchase of development rights in Hamlet as a tool to protect the rest of the town as a tool. So I, I think what Ted is saying is wouldn't we want for any development to happen in the Hamlet to require people to buy development rights from other parts of the town. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, and I think that somebody who's the, uncomfortable with permanently giving up their rights to develop that would be a way to stop them from developing. And the trouble is that you have, a, if you're going to have a receiving area, you know, if the hammers are going to be it, um, there has to be a desire on the part of the developers to actually build there and to want a higher, uh, you know, an, an increased density as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as a desirable thing. And I don't think we have it. To, well, if you're, you have the opposite. In fact, um, if, um, we know that you know developers have been avoiding the Hamlets because it's it's uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's at the moment it's a, something of a less attractive place to be. So um, you you make a, you make a good point. Um, however, you are presuming that sooner or later someone is going to want to build there. Yeah, and we're, we're and I think. We, we can keep adding incentives and making it easier to, that till at some point it becomes attractive enough that somebody actually does it. Yeah, that's that's kind of the, the rub, Ted, is um, that nobody we wants want, to build there. We want to make it easier, not more difficult. There, If there was, you know, people lining up at the door to build in the hamlet, then yeah, it would be great to say, oh, well, if you want to do this, you want us to allow you to do it. You need to buy development rights from other parts in the town. Um, but as it is, you know, I, we're you know, pulling out our hair trying to figure out how to get people to want to do it. Um, and it, and it's difficult. And the you know the main barrier is infrastructure. It's that and the fact that we don't really have the the environment that really creates a successful hamlet right now. So it doesn't have the draw um, that other places like that in the county and the in the market might have. Well, in in a sense, what you're talking about is multiple overlapping chicken and egg situations. Yep. Um, so I, my dogs have stopped howling. Um, so good. <laughs> the, uh, so I, I guess I have a couple of things that I'm not clear about, and I'm going to try to make a question out of this, um, but preface that by, you know, I wonder where we're gonna be in 30 years or 50 years. And, you know, I, I think Catherine can speak to this, you know, looking at the town of Reston. I don't think the town of Reston thought they were gonna be where they are, um, you know, 50 years ago, certainly when I was growing up out there when they were building this, you know, planned community, um, you know, the, I don't think we want our town to be a town only of wealthy people. And how do we, you know, look forward to do something like that? So, so my question is, I guess, you know, do we have any idea how many development units that we're going to be creating? Like, what, you know, what, you know, will it be 500 or a thousand or, you know, you know, it, will we will be able to match growth so that we don't turn into a, um, you know, gated, you know, community for the wealthy? 
that's one of the things that 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 uh, helps to address that. Although overall we're, we're reducing the density, particularly in the low density zone, um, is that we're eliminating or in most of those zones reducing the, the, the required lot size and frontage. Yeah. So so that um, you know somebody can you know sell a one acre lot. It's just that there's you know the, the density is reduced though, but there's there's more flexibility. And uh, but the thrust of it is that we want to make it really easy to do something in the hamlet, and and the key thing was going to be to enable shared water and, and particularly wastewater uh, facilities because that will enable higher density to take place at all, and with the higher density, make more efficient use of land and other other infrastructure like the roads, mm. which should make well, the yeah. lot size of, you know lot. The lots will be cheaper. The the, the buildings could be. You know, well, let, let's let's be realistic. We're, what's happening around the county is that most of the construction is either uh, people building their dream houses on their lots in the country, uh, because the market at the moment is such that when you build the house, by the time you get done building it, it's worth less than the, than it costs you to put it up. So people who don't people do that only if they have. You know they want their place and they've got their dream house, but it's hard to build a spec house in that kind of an environment. Right. Well, I, I and I certainly don't see that happening now. But you can, I, you know, you can see the pressure on Tompkins County, you know, increasing for housing stock and, um, you know, again, you know, do you know the normal thing happening where you know the people who can afford it will have the cl houses closer to Ithaca and everybody will get pushed out. You know, out of town, and I just like us to see you know a way of doing that. And I think the hamlets are a great idea, but for whatever reason, that's this particular kind of development. And what's happening is everybody's building a house on Nelson Road, which I don't really mind because they're great people, and I you know we have a great neighborhood now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, and you know maybe that's the kind of development we should be thinking about is having this for very diverse kind of, you know, dense, you know, you know, big houses, small houses, you know, low income, mid income, high income. Mm -hmm. the, the low income, the face of low income housing at the moment is mostly apartment housing. Mm -hmm. David probably has the statistics on what percentage of the housing is being constructed in the county is, is, is rental, but it's, it's pretty high percentage. I don't have it off the top of my head, but that is um, one thing that the way uh, the way we're working on the zoning would make it easier to do small multifamily buildings, which are the most um, financially efficient to build. You know, something like a four a fourplex, where you're not having elevators, um, but you are having the efficiencies of having units that are sharing walls. Um, that's really the, the cheapest thing. I mean, the cheapest thing you can build is like a 90 unit two story building. Um, but, you know, if you're going to build in smaller increments, something like a, a three to six unit building um, can make a lot of financial sense. So allowing um, the development rights on a parcel to be pulled forward to the street, which is something um, that Joel's proposed. Um, would allow some more of that development while we're also preserving more land. Um, so I think adding that flexibility in housing types helps address the affordability concerns, um, but it does come with a need to, for the community to be more flexible about what, what is getting built. Um, I see that Ted is waiting with a, a question or comment. Yeah, um, I, I think you all heard Dan give this statistic a meeting or two ago, but the average uh, <clears throat> home price in Tompkins County is now over $200,000, um, which, I mean, I, I grew up in an era when that was a lot of money. Today, it's not as much money, but it is a substantial number. And I don't know whether that factors in the value of the underlying land I suppose it's included, but it uh, once again it does. Uh, and I'm sure all of you have also heard the 
various cries of pain um, from people who are finding that single acres are now going for four, six, eight thousand or more dollars, uh, up to twenty thousand dollars, I think, at the corner of King and Sandbank, and um, that sort of speaks to how easy how easy it would be for some for a low income family to be able to purchase their own house. So I'll I'll definitely agree with the, the concept that multifamily houses are going to be the way to go for low income people. Um, a, another update that I wanted to share, I shared this with the Hamlet group last week, but we just um, found out that the town did get um, the additional $30,000 grant that we went after for the Hamlet study. Um, so that will allow us to do some deeper study on um, infrastructure and how we can support additional density in the Hamlet. Because I know that that has been one of the biggest barriers. Um, I spent some time talking to INHS about you know, their projects in Trumansburg and some of the other more rural projects that they've done and they've said that, that when they've looked at Danby, that's really been the thing that stood in the way is that it just is hard to, to come in with the infrastructure um, that you need on a single lot when there's, there's nothing here to help. So I think that's useful. So that's I hope a big plus, because I mean, the $10,000 just wasn't enough to do, in, to do anything with any kind of depth on the, addressing the issue. Yeah, who was the jerk at the can? Well, that was me, <laughs> just so we're clear. <laughs> Well, um, it's, it was all well intentioned and I'm glad we got the extra money. I think that's great. Um, I, I like this idea of the multi, you know, housing kind of thing. And, you know, it would be great if we could figure out how to, um, you know, protect some property just as we're protecting the rural character property um, for that kind of development you know, out here, I mean, what, you know, what a great place for somebody to live, if, but, you know, let's make it affordable for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and another part of making it more affordable to do that kind of development is having a streamlined process, um, because I think Danby's well known for having a pretty difficult process. <laughs> um, and I think making it clear, you know, that there's, First of all, one of the things I've suggested is that we treat one to four units the same. That we treat four units the same way we treat one, one unit. And um, part of the impetus behind that, for those who haven't heard already, is that that's the way the federally backed mortgages treat homes. So if you're getting a, a Fannie Mae or a VA loan um, or other federally backed mortgages, they, it's the same loan product for one to four units. Um, and that's something that a lot of municipalities are taking on. Um, so I, I hope that that will, will help that and just being clear about how you do that and having a, a smooth process, I think is helpful. Um, David, uh, your comment about Danby being known for slow. Mm -hmm. um, it, call this a very subjective observation, but when someone submits a complete application they basically for a single family thing it uh, sorry a single subdivision basically just flies through the planning board that's historically true um, it's uh it's slower here than it is most places because most places the planner would just sign off on it and well, they wouldn't go to a meeting at all well we as you know we've been through that yeah um and it was judged to be not in the best interest to do it that way. Well, I don't know. And, you know, I could see that we would have a reputation as being difficult too, because, you know, our zoning doesn't match our intentions. And so, you know, that's, oh. that's always a clash here. And so mm -hmm. if he's coming to town to develop something, you know, even though the zoning says it's okay, um, you know, the intentions are, are different and they're going to get trouble. Right, yeah. when, you, when somebody proposes something, they get jumped all over because it's not what we want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they get jumped on, but in the end, they get it. 
because that's what the zoning. Well, because they're entitled, right? So yeah, right. So that doesn't slow it down. That that just makes it painful. But hey, it slows well, it down and, and makes it painful. Yeah, I would argue it does slow it down because you know then it gets thrown around between you know boards and. Um, I you know, and it scares people off from how I ended up on one. Yeah. Yeah, when, when an application is complete, the, the, the planning board has 62 days to finish. On the other hand, when I hear yeah. news reports about the planning boards down in the city, it can go on for months and months and months and um, months and that, years. That's a little it, that's a little confusing. But 62 days is how long you have after you close a public hearing to give an answer um, on a subdivision. On site plan review, um, they can keep a public hearing open longer. So the process can be long. A public hearing has to be scheduled within 62 days of getting a complete application. The public hearing for some things can be open as long as 120 days. And once it's closed, then you have to give an answer within 62 days. Um, right, so it, it, can, it can be quite a long process. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're kind of getting off topic here. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see if we can stay on topic and anyway, yeah. talk about the maps and things. I, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm what you've shown today. I'm really happy to see. I mean, it looks like a lot of hard work has gone into looking at the town, and um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's really great. Has has the CAC done a um, natural inventory overlay on this too? <laughs> I don't think they have. Uh, the layers from the NRI were kind of used to guide, um, for example, the difference between rural character one and rural character two. Um, yep. So those layers of steep slopes and habitat connectivity and um, the, uh, what are we calling them? Critical, not critical environmental areas. The UNAs, the unique UNAs, natural areas. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those, those all went into um, defining the differences between those yeah. zones. Um, the CAC hasn't formally taken this up yet, and mostly because it's still um, very much in draft. And if you dig into it deeper, you'll notice, you know, there's it's it's a draft. It's rough. There's still some places where you might think, ah, does that? Does that zone really make sense there? Um, because there's a combination sure. of yeah. things being derived algorithmically and then gone over for you know truth checking and um, there's a lot of parcels in the town and um, yep. I think before I published the first map I hadn't really looked at every single one of them. So yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, no, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's a bit of the meeting process and some of the stuff that we're going through. Okay. Um, you mentioned steep slopes in passing. Mm -hmm. um, knowing uh, the steep slope between Danby and West Danby, that is uh, west of Comfort and Bald Hill Roads and east of Brown Road or, or whatever it is down there, those are essentially unbuildable. And you said that you used steep slopes somewhat in determining those, the, um, the, the zones. Did you consider making those steep slopes into uh, dark green, you know, the high, high preservation areas? No, I, I think I'm just sticking with the principle that we agreed to as a group, which is that we weren't putting anyone in the dark green without. <laughs> We're kind of going with doubling the required minimum density. And you know, there are other other requirements that protect steep slopes, but I'm not putting anything else in the 25 acre zone. I think. Um, so um, what what kind of input do you want from us tonight? I mean, yeah, I think you really were looking for, you know, whether this looked like a good direction from the board. Yeah, uh, I was. And I moving was hoping, forward. Yeah, I, I wanted to hear if this sounds scary, if I sound way off, um, or if we should just keep uh, working with the committee moving forward and showing progress. Um, Leslie, what do you think? I think her dinner looks pretty good to me. <laughs> She's having dinner. Just salad. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, th I think a lot of, a lot of thought has gone into the, the map and I, I 
I know that initially we we talked about having different zones for you know um, and having allowing certain things in in certain zones and I think that's I, I like that I think that's great um, I I think I I feel good about the direction it's going in. I, I'm and I'm with Leslie. I mean, I really, uh, I, I really looks like some good work is in there. I have this new soapbox that I'm on, which is about, um, you know, making sure that we have diverse, um, you know, income levels and and housing opportunities in the, in the town. But um, yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with where we are. The one thing that's not yet part of the mix, and and it remains to be seen whether it becomes part of the mix, is whether there should be uh, agricultural zones specifically. And there's, there's been a working group formed um, that's led by Alyssa Davidier and um, and Betsy Kiyokoski. And and they they managed to get a, a meeting, it wasn't last time, it was a week ago, Saturday, of uh, people who are in agriculture in some way or another. Uh, and it was a really good meeting, but the, the, the question arises whether whether protecting the land resource is an important part of supporting agriculture, or whether there are other things that might be more important. Um, one th that that meeting talked about the importance of value added in order for agriculture to be viable, and the the processing facility is an important part of that, and making it possible for the agriculture people who are interested in agriculture to site those processing facilities somewhere in Danby. Uh, is part of the equation that that needs to be thought about. So you know, it, it could be that that could be connected to, you know, the agricultural zoning. So the so the, the the kind of processing facilities we're talking about, which are, you know, the ability to 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 make things out of out of wool or out of milk or out of um, you know nuts or you know, there there you know a variety of things that that could develop, and um, and that is and that interfaces with the concern that I have about our ability to accommodate business altogether and where it's most appropriate that we locate it. Because right now we do home occupations really well and we don't do much of anything else very well. So we've talked about what kind of businesses are appropriate in the Hamlet. Um, we got hung up on that too, uh, to some degree, because it's, it, you, you, don't, you don't want something that's out of scale, taking up a lot of space and what's your core but there are some things that we might want to accommodate in the town someplace. But so that means the question is, first of all, what are we willing to entertain? We've already in our previous, in our existing zoning say we're not interested in heavy industrial uses. And we have in our, ag uh, in our right to engage in agricultural, agricultural activity law that we're not friendly to CAFOs. So we're not looking for large scale agriculture or industrial uh, activities. But beyond that, there's a lot of different kinds of businesses. And, and one of them that we've been, had to deal with to a limited degree already is the, is the agritourism aspect uh, and with the tasting rooms. And that has potential to grow into you know, something more and different, but, uh, but it's kind of connected to the land uh, and, and doesn't necessarily fit into the idea of having our commercial stuff in a commercial zone unless you want to regard an agricultural zone as commercial. So, you know, the, the, what kind of businesses we were willing to accommodate, how we accommodate them and where, so that, so it, that we ensure that we have the ability to, for them to locate in Danby, but in a way that doesn't create problems for us with, um, you know, being incompatible with the neighborhoods that, 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 that we also have more and more of. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, you know, I, I, I would certainly like to see people who um, want agriculture encouraged to do agriculture. It almost seems to me like the agriculture is like your green zone where, uh, yeah. you know, somebody could be put into it, um, you know, if that's what they wanted. Um, and it's, you know, hard to get out of or something like that. But, you know, it becomes that kind of zoning. Um, and... Um, one, th one thing we talked about was in, in the ag zone, uh, if we have one, requiring that the lots either be very small or very large, but not in between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I had a, I had a chat with a long chat with Melissa after the meeting about said so well would it be so bad if we required that the that the lots be clustered not clustered but you know brought to the roadside so that the, the area behind could be kept open in 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 on you know undeveloped contiguous tracks which would be better for some kinds of agriculture but having the there's always a problem well not always but there's occasionally a problem with some kinds of agriculture coexisting with residential uses in proximity. Well, I'd rather have a farm in my backyard than a golf course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the people are nicer. <laughs> <laughs> they don't break um, your windows. <laughs> I think uh, one of the things that I've heard, um, and it, it really is, uh, I guess, a sign of where Danby is in the kind of cycle of land values, was that farmers were more concerned about um, reducing restrictions that might hamper their business than they were concerned about encroaching residential development. Um, and that I think there's, there's less of a, of a feeling that they need their own zone separate where housing wouldn't be allowed, which is, you know, what happens eventually when the housing demand gets so high, nobody can afford to buy land for agriculture because it's priced at the price for land for housing. Um, it doesn't seem right now that that is a major concern among people who are doing agriculture. Um, it may be something to be reticent or careful about in the future, but mostly um, from what I've heard, what they're immediate concerns are is making sure that the variety of things that they want to do would be allowed um, and not prevented by the town. Well, although at the, at the ag meeting there was a, there was some considerable concern about some of the best land in, 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 in Danby, which is uh, along East Miller Road, both sides, uh, was under development pressure and, uh, you know, there wasn't any kind of a consensus about what ought to be done about it, but there was, but that was definitely a concern it's that, you know, we, we don't have that much really good land and uh, How do we, how should we have, an, should we have an agriculture zone? Should it matter? But it's, it's, it's only, we're only at the beginnings of conversations about that. So I can't say I would characterize the group as having any firm opinion about it. I see Catherine Hunter's been waiting. Hi, Catherine. I just a thought um, about these uh, development rights, et cetera, and agriculture and affordable. Is there, is there even a way to do some kind of development rights bank? Um, for instance, let's say I wanted to give up some of my development rights and put it in a bank. And I could say that the two uses I were interested in were, would be clustered housing um, if somebody came in and wanted to do that, clustered housing or um, uh, small time uh, agricultural, just to, you know, I, I, it's just a fuzzy thought, fuzzy question. An interesting, an interesting wrinkle that I hadn't thought of. It's, it's I did really think about we the, 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 the board than a bank. I mean, you're the, just letting people know that you have it and you have particular uses in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we have, I did think about, we, we, the town could play a broker's role in having a, 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 you know, a pool, if you will, of available um, development rights where people would, are willing to sell them uh, and, 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 and associated what they're willing to sell them for. So that if somebody wants to acquire development rights, they can, they can go to that. They could either approach their neighbors directly and see what they're willing to um, sell them for, or um, they can go to the pool or both. Yeah. And that, that's not what I was asking. That, no. that's, that's selling my rights. Instead, right. of, instead of doing a conservation easement, if I wanted to put my development quote rights to some kind of conservation easement, cool. I mean, I, I know it's kind of a kooky idea, but it's not, it might be something that could back to your brokering idea but not that I necessarily want to sell those rights, but I might be willing to give up some of those rights to something specific like the agriculture or like the affordable or the clustered. Well, that's an interesting thought. Basically, yeah. you'd, be, you'd be willing to 
to sell them cheaply, so to speak, and to allow somebody else to to to. Well, what would it do though? Because what you what you when you're selling development rights, somebody else is buying, and what they're trying to do is is to increase the density of whatever they want to do on yeah. the property that they're acquiring. Yeah, I think that makes sense in the case of housing that you could donate. You know, say you have. 20 acres and we are at 10 acre average zoning, you could donate one development right so that someone who is building affordable housing could build one more unit than the town would otherwise allow. Right. And that would yeah. extinguish your development right on your property and transfer right. it to them. Yeah. Yep. It, it wouldn't really work with agriculture because it, there's an unlimited right to do agriculture. So they're, they don't need that from you, but um, for something like affordable housing, I think that would be possible. Yeah, and it would be something that maybe to go into the conservation easement idea instead of doing the. Um, well, for properties where we want people to get rid of their rights, it certainly would be. Um, it would, we can encourage people to, to to sell them to people for who who want to acquire them. <laughs> to go off the topic too much i was just trying to stay on where we were talking about the the hamlet idea that we've been talking about and how the and the affordable housing and the idea that matt was saying about how do we keep the town from becoming um ripe and that the real issue with reston is huge is and, and every time the last time i brought this up i got hosed for it but the <laughs> the issue is we don't know what's going to happen in as matt said 20 or 30 years Right. When some kind of big development people come in, and I, I've gotten more things recently, they are fighting tooth and nail to try and keep those open, just the golf courses. I mean, they are you trying to, and now the tactic is people are coming in and saying, well, the trees that are in the golf course are inviting invasives, and they're going to rot, and they're causing this. So they're, they, these developing people have all kinds of tactics. So anything that, you know, we don't see that here, but these are that's yeah. the, the 20 yeah, right. idea. Yeah. It doesn't have, we don't need a Hamlet tomorrow. It would be fine if we had one, but we want the ability to have the Hamlet in for a long term, whenever the person's ready. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean? That yeah. 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 Bruce. I, I like to piggyback on Matt's thoughts about affordability mm -hmm. with some uh, recent examples on uh, things that have occurred on my street. Uh, a really, really run down uh, house was sold at foreclosure for about $34,000. Uh, they put a, a fair amount of lipstick on that. But it's it 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 it, it, and it but it, but it wasn't a really a, a rebuild and they did nothing with the septic or or or, or foundation and turned around and who were us just sold it for over through two hundred thirty thousand. Okay. Uh, uh, it, 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 to a, a, who I think is the the lady that's the head of uh, Tiger County's uh, uh, cooperative extension. Uh, my other neighbor bought their place. Uh, in the early 2000s uh, for uh, 75,000. They're going to relocate to Texas now. They've talked talk to a, uh, a, uh, a a real estate agent and that's gonna go on the market at 315,000. Yeah. And uh, the neighbors are thinking, one of my other neighbors is thinking that it might be a good investment property. There's no way anyone can pay 315 for it if they're just gonna live there. They want, they, but they think they can justify it by putting by 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 having it uh, on a Airbnb, so the uh, idea that they can generate that much more uh, uh, income uh, for uh, with short-term rentals over, over over regular has has driven it up. Roy Casterline's old house on Brown Road is empty. It's owned by Shane Spencer. Uh, again, a local fellow is looking around trying to find a rent rent here where his family's lived in the in the hamlet his whole life. He went and talked to Shane. Shane said, I could rent it for maybe 16 a year, but I can get 65 for it on A, B, a or B and B. So he's talking about uh, uh, the, 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 that some of our housing stock is being diverted. And these are modest places in my estimation. Uh, 
and uh, there's a lot uh, over a house burned on uh, Maple Avenue, which is two acres. It's on uh, municipal water. Uh, apparently, it has a couple of wells on it, but they're West Danby wells, so they're not reliable. No septic. Uh, the, the person that bought it paid $25,000 for it, for, you know, which was astounding in 2013. Uh, the the relationship between the two people that were going to build there has uh, deteriorated and the, the lot's got to go up for sale. We're still trying to figure out the same young man who's been trying to find a place to rent uh, is, uh, is, is, is going to attempt to buy, to, to buy these two acres. The price has still yet to be established, but, you're, but, but what Matt's concern seems awfully close to home and very immediate right here in, uh, in, in our neighborhood. Yeah, and if that, when, when houses start selling for two hundred thousand dollars plus, it drives the value of everything else around it. Uh, especially what they are. Yeah. Yeah. So one one interesting thing that's happening here is that the 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 cost of the existing housing is rising rapidly, and it's approaching the point where it's a, where it's. Uh, getting to be almost what it costs to build. So there will come a tipping point where the value of the existing buildings is more than it costs to build a new one. And oh, yeah, and Joel, change uh, the dynamic uh, completely. Uh, Wendy's house up at the end, you know, again, another Castor Line Sun house at the end of Maple Ave, uh, yep. the yep, just, that, just where the pavement is, that sold for 210,000 and that's, that's a cracker box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now we have the cost of construction sitting between 20, uh, 250 and uh, $300 a square foot around the county. Um, so, you know, we're still, even with the, the prices of the used inventory going up dramatically, it's still significantly cheaper to buy something that exists than to build something new. Uh, right, but people, Joel, modest, people are modest income or young people just getting started are at a significant disadvantage. It's basically yeah, yeah. priced priced out yeah. altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I've shared with some of the people around town. I'm house shopping now. Um, my family is just finally able to afford a house, and we put um, a twenty five thousand dollar over offer over asking offer in for a house um, with almost no contingencies except the bank and we're beat by a cash offer. And that's happened three times already. And it's, you know, that's kind of the market that we're in. I just heard about a house near me in the city that went for a hundred thousand over asking. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's kind of a crazy time right now, but it's also- yeah, it's the same, you know, as, uh, yeah. same as the lumber prices. This is all gonna change, but yeah. at least the yeah. lumber prices will. But, um, well, I'm not sure we can we can solve all of the um, social ills of uh, yeah. <laughs> the country in Tompkins County right now, but certainly I think it's good that we're aware of them and yeah, uh, you know that we pay attention to that. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I, I guess are there any other things that you want from us, David? No, I think this has been a productive meeting. Um, I appreciate your feedback, and uh, I think we've done what I came here to do. And okay. uh, right. we should all go enjoy the last few hours of minutes of sunlight. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. right. <laughs> I, I would, I would uh, vote for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for coming, Matt. Because without you, we wouldn't have had a quorum at all. <laughs> yep. I'm glad to be here. Uh, you know, I thanks. can hear your dogs from here. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Right. Nobody's ever complained before. <laughs> First time I heard it, I thought somebody was being killed. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> just, oh, poor dog. Just, just the eight dogs. Yes, they're all they're being killed. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right. Okay. Thank, Janice, thanks night, for everybody. texting me. Otherwise, I would have forgotten completely. <laughs> all right. Thanks all. Have a good night. See you on Wednesday. Yep. <laughs>